Hello everyone. My name is Ankur Patel. I'm a program manager with the identity team at Microsoft. And I'm thrilled to share with the InterOpen community uh, our work around the implementation of open standards around decentralized identity based on specs for verifiable credentials and decentralized identifiers. In this talk, we will cover uh, why do we need decentralized identity? How does it work? take you through a qu quick demo, and then look at some code on how you can go about implementing such a, such a solution, and we'll cover what's next. So let's first start with why do we need decentralized identity? Today, our identity is uh, considered the same as a username and password. However, we know it's a lot more than that. It is in fact everything we say and do in our everyday lives. The problem with this picture though is it's a lot more accurate if it's depicted in this way. As a result, we wake up to everyday headlines around endless breaches of personal data, billions spent on audit. Many displaced individuals don't even have a digital identity. And in some cases, such a digital identity, even if you had it, could disappear based on a technology provider's choice. Over the last two and a half years, we've been incubating uh, and participating with the community in developing the standards that are informing work around verifiable credentials and decentralized identifiers. They're based on talking to a lot of customers across the consumer space, as well as enterprises and governments. Here's a quick summary of some of our learnings. The very first thing, as we would all have empathy for from our everyday lives as individuals, is that we seek greater control over in our information and our data. Today, uh, that information is not directly under our control. We lease it from centralized identity provider systems. And then as and when those systems are breached, we end up losing control over our data and in turn, what the world gets to know about us. Therefore, what consumers are seeking for is greater control over how and when their information is used. Organizations, on the other hand, who provide services to such institutions are relying on uh, identity systems to do more. Today, more than 20 million businesses depend on Azure AD. However, they want to understand that beyond trusting Azure AD to be compliant, how might they verify who is presenting this credential beyond possession of a username and password? When we think about collaborating with everyone as an organization, Today, it requires setting up business invitations between two businesses to interact with each other. Take, for example, NHS, who's hosting this uh, hackathon, is many uh, different hospitals and education institutions needing to work together with each other. But setting up federations for all these in institutions to exchange uh, credentials with each other is a non-trivial task. Now imagine if you are a large conglomerate which has 50,000 suppliers in your supply chain or that you need to work with new emergent uh, supply chain partners. How do you go and establish security and policy and yet make sure it's easy for your end users to use? These are difficult things to do today using centralized identity systems. Finally, when we look at regulatory concerns around things like general data protection, uh, out of European Union or in the financial industry, there would be things like know your customer or anti-money laundering. All of these regulatory concerns have a few things in common. The first one is that uh, the end users have to incur new friction as they are prompted with uh, lots of notices of accepting varying degrees of terms, which are difficult to understand. Institutions have to ensure that not only are they cataloging all the information correctly and ensuring that when a user request comes in for uh, sharing such data or improving verifiability, uh, they can do so quickly and do so in a manner that is secure. Both of those things end up being at odds with each other, having things secure and be accessible quickly. The net result of this is today's systems uh, our approaches to implementing compliance with such systems is uh, not working well, or at least not well enough. Finally, when we go to scenarios around government uh, related scenarios for IDs for border crossing, for example, the fact that you may have a digital identity in one jurisdiction, how might another country resolve that or private businesses within that company resolve that? 
This is not easy to do today. This is most acutely experienced when we look at the scenario around digital identity for refugees, where it would definitely not be appropriate to say you need to go get an account from uh, a company like Microsoft in Redmond, Washington to get your aid from the UN. This first and foremost proves the point that in order for us to enable social and financial inclusion for everyone, we need a new technology stack which empowers each of us to own and control our own identity. It is to this end that we've been incubating this idea around how do we recognize the user to also be a data controller. Our incubation hypothesis statement used to be the following, but if you notice, we no longer have that as a title of this slide. This is now our product mission statement that we're implementing towards. We believe that each of us needs a digital identity that we own and control, one which securely and privately stores all elements of our digital identity. Now that first sentence, is something that is difficult to argue. However, what is difficult to pull off is how might we seamlessly integrate such a solution with the existing internet, as opposed to rewrite all applications from ground up. And that's what we've been spending a lot of our time with the community members on developing open interoperable standards. We've made good progress on it, much work remains. So let me show you that through a demo on what works today and what's coming up next. In this scenario, we are going to look at a student getting a portable identity card as a way to get discounts uh, from a bookstore. The work that we are showing you here is very similar to what we did with NHS on pre-employment check. So you can imagine a doctor graduating and being able to prove um, that they were a medical school graduate. So in this scenario, Alice receives a invitation from her university, Contoso University, that says, uh, get here to click scan here to get started, to get your student discounts. So she scans this QR code, which is based on open standards around an open ID request. And she receives a request in the Microsoft case, we've implemented this, uh, the, the open standard using Microsoft Authenticator. And she sees a request that says, Contoso University would like to issue you a digital student ID card. To accept it, she needs to sign in to her university using her username and password so that the university knows who to issue the card to. Upon filling it in, she receives a notice to accept such a credential. When she does, a new identifier is generated based on her biometric gesture, in this case, a fingerprint ID, but it could just as well have been a face ID or a pin in case of a feature phone. Upon doing this gesture, the university receives a decentralized identifier that they recognize as the subject for a new credential and they issue a new student ID card. Now, a handful of details are visible in this card when she clicks on it. Alice can see her name and other facts that have been attested to by the university. She also receives an activity update in her uh, Microsoft Authenticator that says, on this date and time you were issued this card by Contoso. She can then use this at places such as a fabric and bookstore, a fictitious bookstore for this demo, uh, where she can verify her credentials. Upon clicking the link, her Microsoft Authenticator now receives a permission request saying fabric and bookstore would like to verify that she's a student with Contoso University. Upon allowing so, using the same biometric gesture, she can cryptographically sign and approve such a request. Fabric and bookstore now is able to verify who issued such a credential and that the person who's presenting this credential indeed is the one who can be in possession of it based on that biometric gesture. Upon accepting it, one of the other things that Alice receives new compared to today's GDPR world is a receipt, a receipt that is told, uh, stored in her Microsoft Authenticator in a common place where all her web interactions can now be found very easily. And because she is the controller of this decentralized identifier, she can choose to revoke it if she wants to. So if she revokes this access now, Fabric and Bookstore will no longer be able to verify if she's an ongoing student at the university or not. And she will have a receipt saying so, that she has no longer granted access to it. Now that same interaction that was done using one card, such as Contoso University Student ID card, 
she could uh, have many other uh, facts about her life collected here. So that, for example, if she goes to Bellows College, another fictitious character in our demo, uh, request credentials for not only knowing that where did she go to school previously, or she, if she has other skills such as project management, she can approve it using the same gesture. One of our key learnings early on had been that uh, it would not be good enough if such a system was more secure or privacy respecting, but if it was not also easy to use. And therefore, we've done a whole lot of work here to make sure that the experience feels familiar. The net result on Bellows College side, just like a bookstore, was to verify such credentials and grant her access to whatever services they deem. So let's take a look at how all of this works. Let's start first with the fact that the bedrock of this implementation is based on open standards. Our mental model is very much taking the identity provider role in traditional identity systems and shrinking it into software that a user owns and controls based on open standards. There are typically three key things that a identity system provides. A user agent, which is where your credentials are managed. Now in legacy systems, there are typically usernames and passwords, and we all know the perils of usernames and passwords. So in this modern approach, these are based on cryptographic keys. But if you notice from a user interaction perspective, all they saw it as is a biometric gesture of a fingerprint ID, a face ID, or a um, pin, if you will. Such a gesture controls credentials or keys being created for signing and presentation. They are stored in a technology called Identity Hub, which is another piece of open standard being developed in Decentralized Identity Foundation, uh, or DIFF. Uh, this is a place where permissions are stored and maybe even the credentials are stored to be shared. These are stored locally on a user's device, such as a mobile app, and they could optionally sync to the cloud so that they are available on multiple devices. The final piece of the puzzle is a universal resolver and a open directory system. In a traditional identity system, that role is done by a centralized directory service. In a decentralized system, we talk to blockchains and ledgers, and it says in plural because based on open standards, at least in Microsoft approach, we are blockchain agnostic. And we use Universal Resolver as another piece of open technology to describe how to resolve a given identifier and public key, care, key pair mapping. Think of it as Universal Resolver is a DNS lookup, if you will, uh, for the DID world. So given a DID, it can return to you what public key is associated with it so you can cryptographically verify a, tr a transaction, such as doing DID authentication or presentation. So imagine if you are presented with a verifiable credential now, you would be able to say who signed it and what does it stand for. So the final piece of the open standard puzzle we are implementing here is verifiable credentials, which has been ratified in W3C. Um, so these are all the different pieces of open standards technology that we are leveraging. Uh, there is much more details on this in our developer facing documentation site, and they will be included at the end of this presentation as well. So let's look at uh, how the code works under the hood. The very first thing in our implementation of these open standards you would have to do is set up uh, your private key as a issuer. So this is what Contoso University, for example, would have to go about doing. In this case, uh, you would store your private key in Azure Key Vault and create a mapping with a DNS domain because if you had a key, how does somebody know who this key belongs to? And since most of the internet works using DNS addresses today, you can create an association of your DID with a well-known uh, DNS domain. So how do you go about doing it? The very first thing you would create is a well-known file that does this mapping. One of the ideas being incubated in uh, Decentralized Identity Foundation is the, uh, is the work around a well-known location to publish such a file, such as your web address. And then create a binding using a verifiable credential that says this DID belongs to the following domain, in this case, Contoso EDU. If this file is now published to a well-known location, everybody in the world would know that if such a DID signed a transaction or requested a transaction, then which domain does this belong to? The next thing you saw in the demo 
was the issuance of a student ID card. So using Azure AD again as a tool, Contosi University can publish a look and feel uh, of the card. They can publish what are the attributes that would define the card. So in this case, here's a student ID card, who it's issued by, what's the background color, what's the description going to be, etc. And this is solely under the control of the issuer, such as Contosi University. Furthermore, they get to control what are the attributes of uh, such a credential. So based on the verifiable credential spec, they will be able to define the attributes of it and the key value pairs. So in this case, it's a student ID, when does it expire, and what's the profile picture, for example. Next, you would describe what are the requirements for your Contoso to issue such a credential. The first thing you will notice is very similar to a traditional identity system, is expiry. How long is this good for? The next thing is, a set of attestations that you can present and request as input. So you can request the user to fill out a form or present a verifiable credential or even produce a traditional identity token with uh, attributes inside it, right? This is just a normal JWT uh, Java web token. Now, what does this manifest itself into? This looks like a QR code from an end user perspective, which when scanned results in an application like Microsoft Authenticator presenting such a request. How did Authenticator know to form this UI? So what's happening under the hood is an OpenID request based on existing OpenID Connect standard is being made to a service endpoint that Azure AD spun up for Contoso University. When Microsoft Authenticator contacted such an address, which was listed in that QR code, it found the following contract address. The contract address is what points to how to get a student ID card, for example. Before presenting such a request, one of the other things Microsoft Authenticator does, it is verifies who is this request from. Is it from a trusted entity by checking the Java Web Token signature, just like we do for normal identity transactions today. The resulting screen is the following UI that the end user saw or Alice saw. She's asked to sign in her username and password. Upon doing so, a normal OpenID Connect uh, authorization request is sent to Authenticator. And it is receiving a uh, set of ID token attributes in it such as Alice's name and expiry of the student address, uh, student ID card, and the student ID itself, as you saw as attributes of the card. Next thing, however, in the process, in order for this to be a verifiable, a portable verifiable credential, it needs to be tied to a decentralized identifier. To do so, Alice is prompted to sign this transaction and generate a decentralized identifier. That's what's happening under the hood using a verifiable credential SDK, which is open sourced by us, and you'll find a link in the, at the end of this presentation. Uh, Microsoft Authenticator here generates a decentralized identifier and posts this to the issuance service on Azure AD. The result of it is a new credential, and this credential has three key things that are different than existing domain-based credentials. The first thing you will notice is that the subject of this identifier is a user-owned DID as opposed to a domain-bound object ID, which is what happens in a traditional identity system. The second thing you notice is the issuer here, instead of it being a domain-based certificate, it is a decentralized identifier bound to an issuer's identity so that anyone in the world can resolve this without having to set up federations with the issuer. And yet, the issuer has control over expiry and other attributes about these controls. This has been a key set of work that has gone on in W3C and the Decentralized Identity Foundation, and we're thrilled to share our first implementation of it, as you've been hearing from other people in the conference as they're attempting their own early implementations of it. Next, you will notice is the payload of this credential, which is also based on the W3C standard for verifiable credentials which lists the attributes of the claim. Finally, you will, be, you will be able to see that the credential is signed by the issuer's DID instead of that domain certificate, which again makes it easy for a recipient of such a credential to verify quickly 
who was this issued by, who was it issued to, and uh, how might I verify that these two facts are true. Next, all of these things happened under the hood. The only thing if you notice the user did was scan the QR code, type in the username and password, and accepted a card by doing that biometric gesture, resulting in the following screen that you are seeing. When Alice now goes to the bookstore, by now you're familiar with the flow. Upon clicking the verify credential, she receives a request. Fabricam Bookstore here formed this request based on existing OpenID Connect uh, protocol. So you'll notice here that it is asking for a credential of type student ID from Contoso University. For the new work that's happening in Decentralized Identity Foundation, based on present presentation exchange protocol work, we'll be modifying this work now so that the bookstore can ask of such a credential from any university as opposed to specifically tied to Contoso University. Stay tuned for that update. Next, you'll be able to verify the signature of the verifier so that Alice's Microsoft Authenticator knows that it is specifically this website they're interacting with is who is requesting this credential as opposed to somebody else pretending to be it. From her experience perspective, Alice would approve this request using the same biometric gesture as she's used to presenting and, and accepting any card. The result of it is somewhat different though. Now, Fabricam Bookstore is able to verify that the subject of the credential being presented and the entity who's presenting this credential are both matching up in terms of signatures. And therefore, someone else can't pretend to be presenting this credential. And only Alice could have presented this credential. At the end of this verification process, the bookstore can entitle you to a discount. Now, one last thing that's super important is that the, re the return receipt is signed using the verifier's DID itself, so Fabric and Bookstore's DID. It is how Microsoft Authenticator is therefore able to present a signed receipt that says, you, Alice, shared this credential with Fabric and Bookstore at this date and time for this purpose. And then that's what enables her to revoke such an access going further. And just like Fabric and Bookstore made a request for one credential, Bellows College could make a request for more than one credential. So this gives you a quick overview of how our system works. Let me share with you where we are going next. So as I shared with you, our key focus has been on not only making this uh, new implementation of identity systems uh, more secure and compliant, but a key learning has been they need to be easy to use. So the idea of having cryptographic keys and gestures needs to be far more accessible. To help accelerate our learnings, we are open sourcing this SDK and it's now available at this address on your screen. Uh, this is the same SDK we are using to do our implementation of Microsoft Authenticator because a key cornerstone here is that these sets of credentials and identity must be open and interoperable and therefore anyone else in the world can go and implement their own version of Microsoft Authenticator as they see fit. There's much more work remaining here such as revocation, such as recovery and our blog post describes our progress on each of those work fronts and I'm happy to engage with you. We'll give you our contract information here on the next slide. The next key problem we had to solve was around performance and scale. Uh, we're thrilled to share with you the open source implementation of uh, ION, which is Identity Overlay Network. It's a layer two network protocol that runs on top of Bitcoin so that it can uh, give the same level of uh, trustworthiness that proof of work gives for the blockchain people um, without compromising uh, on the trust, if you will. However, our implementation remains open based on Decentralized Identity Foundation's Universal Resolver driver model. So we are able to support more than one chain. One of them is ION. The key bedrock of this is based on SciTree protocol, which is another open standard being developed in Decentralized Identity Foundation. So as you can see, a lot of open standard work has gone into this. And therefore, our final call to action on this is to further join, collaborate, and contribute the work to DIFF. More than 90 companies are now part of this growing community. Uh, some are large names, uh, brand names. Some of them are startups. 
uh, some of them are nonprofit groups. And uh, every day this work is becoming more important, particularly as we think about emerging scenarios around health-related and financial-related industry. Therefore, there are two new projects that have been kicked off in Decentralized Identity Foundation around zero-knowledge proof and self-owned key recovery. We are thrilled to participate in those working groups. And if you are interested in partnering, we would love for you to join the community on it. So here's a quick update of our work. Uh, this QR code will get you to our website for developer documentation, our latest blog updates, and for you to engage with us if you have any feedback around this work. Hope this is useful. Please let us know what you think. We can't wait to hear from you. Enjoy the rest of the hackathon.